1978, I became a follower of Jesus Christ. But I wasn't a world Christian until seven years later. My guest is a go-to person on global missions. He taught on global Christianity at Gordon College from 1985 to 2015. The title of his last book is Defining Great Commission, Great Compassion, Following Jesus and Loving the World. Paul Borthwick calls himself a global pilgrim, and I'm sure he wants each one of us to become one of those too. Amen. I'd be happy to encourage that. I love the encouragement that is going to come from the fact that as a young person, you rejected the faith of your parents. Yes, I was raised in a Christian family, and like many, the faith of my parents hadn't become mine yet until I went in the rebellious route. I was at the age where if I had had, had the option, I would have gone to Woodstock and been a hippie, but I was just a little bit too young. And, uh, but I rejected the faith of my parents, uh, and then very dramatically, on a youth retreat that I was forced to go on, because my parents said, you know, if you're going to play football, you have to go to this event. Good. Uh, I came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and uh, committed my life to Jesus. I was 17 years old and thankfully haven't turned back. Oh, that's so good. And, and early. Uh, well, I'm sure your parents didn't think that was early. but Yeah, but let me, let me just say a word of encouragement, though, because almost everybody that's watching this show or anybody I know has somebody in their family that's not yet there. Someone they're praying for. Someone they're praying for. Yeah. And I would just say, don't give up on your family. God will bring them back, but it might not be in your time, it would be in his. Thank you. Thank you for that, Paul. You say that God dealt with your fears. What were your fears? Well, as a young person, I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of flying, which actually is re remarkable considering the fact that I do what You're I do You're flying now. around the world all the time. Uh, but I was afraid of uh, being unpopular. I was afraid of failure. A lot of it had to do with family background and, that, that and whatnot. But it was actually Isaiah 41.10, don't fear for I am with you. Don't anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will comfort you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's the verse that brought me to Jesus. I want people to know that you are on staff with a Development Associates International, a training group helping develop leaders in the under-resourced world. Your wife, Christy, is a part of this? She's also part of it. She's traveled with me to, I think, in the course of our 38 years of marriage, she's been with me in 97 countries. Wow. And I've been to a few more than that. A lot of plane rides. A lot of plane rides <laughs> and a lot of uh, cultural discomfort. Yeah, change. Because you've got to be willing to just accept the fact you don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going on. You don't know the food. You don't know. And just by way of greetings, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Uganda and came home for four days and went off to Moldova, which is east of Romania. And uh, so I just want to bring greetings to you and the, the people who watch uh, to the global family because we're part of a world that they estimate now that 70% of the people who are followers of Jesus, they would call themselves Christ followers, 70% of those people live in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. And are projected to be the mission sending countries to us. Already, last November, I was at a student missions conference in Nigeria there were four Westerners there and 6,000 Nigerian students, all led by Nigerians, challenging these students to go to the ends of the earth to evangelize. And they're doing it. Oh, in the United States, there's a Nigerian mission agency that's planted 500 churches in the United States. Wow, wow. You know, I just have to make reference to this because this comes from the secular world. Foreign Affairs magazine, the March-April issue, and this amazing article, China's Great Awakening, How the People's Republic Got Religion. It's just exciting to see. It's making world news. 20 well, million new Christians a year out of China. And, and some of us are old enough. You're probably not, but I am. No, no, I am. Okay. Uh, Thank I'm you. Old enough to remember the day when we weren't even sure if there were any Christians left, early 70s. You know, and then all of a sudden it was 1 million Christians. Today they estimate the church in China just the Christian church, and there's other religions also infiltrating China, but the Christian church is estimated now between 100 to 125 million 
in a country that it is still communist. Yes. And there's actually movements in China to equip the Chinese to send missionaries across the Buddhist, Hindu, and Muslim world. So they're so courageous, and they have suffered so much. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is the church in China is so strong because it has been purified by suffering. It, ab absolutely, purified by suffering. We, I was at a, uh, a meeting in Indonesia last year, and there were two Chinese pastors, both of whom had spent a decade in prison. In prison. But they interestingly said now the Chinese government's not putting as many of them in prison <laughs> because they realize every time they put a Chinese pastor in prison... They, they evangelize the whole place. They, they, make a, they make the pastor a hero, and they end up promoting Christianity because of the attention. So... It's just, you know, it's God's doing things we just can't fathom, we can't even dream of. We need to hear so much more about it. Now, you say you've been a hundred uh, trips, I think, with short-term groups. Uh, here's a, a place of debate. Yes. You know, what do you see as the value of, I mean, it costs a lot of money. You have to raise a lot of money to go to these far-flung places, sometimes just for two or three weeks. It's, what do well, you say about that? actually, sometimes even shorter than that nowadays, really? because well, because so many places are accessible by long haul jets, you can actually go to Uganda as I just did, teach for five days, preach for three days, and Squish be back it into in a ten week, days. Ten. Yeah. Um, the the greatest advantage, and I'm a, I'm a person who got introduced to global Christianity by short term missions, mm. so it's impossible for me to, in a sense, bite the hand that fed me, <laughs> you know. But the reality is. They are awesome in terms of giving people a sense of a bigger world, of God not necessarily being an American or Canadian <laughs> or speaking English or French, you know, giving people a sense of the church around the world. Uh, I think short-term missions takes you into a world where the church is living the book of Acts. It's brand new, it's Holy Spirit, it's, you know, there's a lot more, uh, uh, shall we say, mir miraculous stories that you hear. Now, there's, the downside is it's a lot of money, but if it's well-planned and well-led with a purpose and follow-up, short-term missions can have an awesome long-term effect. If it's just a cool experience where you buy a T-shirt and have a few slides to show, then it's not just a waste of money. You might as well just go to Ep Epcot Center in Disney. Uh -huh. But I'm sure your observation is that for the most part, that young person's heart is broken for the things that break the heart of God. Well, because you get to see it, even smell it. You get mm. to see a world that doesn't look like any of our nice Boston suburbs. I'm just thinking of my son. Who, I won't say where he went, but I, I've never seen someone appreciate driving up Brant Street. Mm -hmm. That's a street that you, you just came up. It, just because of the, the order and he talked about smells, and he talked about just the chaotic nature of mm -hmm. a place he'd spent two and a half months, and I thought, well, this is good for him. Well, and actually, the short-term mission tip when you come back oftentimes gives a platform for sharing your faith, because people say, where were you? Mm -hmm. And you have to explain it. And other times, it gives you a vision for the cross-cultural people right in your midst. Ah. Because all of a sudden, you go on a short-term mission trip. My first one was, was to Haiti. I didn't realize when I got back to Boston that Boston has one of the largest populations of Haitians in America. But I wouldn't see them if I hadn't been to Haiti first. Mm. We need to talk about refugees, and we're going to do that in just a moment. But 